Futures TV show, sponsored by CME Group and Trade Station. Hey everybody, welcome to Futures TV show. Many of you know me from my podcast, Futures Radio Show. And I've been told I have a face for radio, but hair for TV, so I'm glad to be here today on Futures TV show, having a good hair day. And in this episode, I will be sitting down with two of my favorite traders and a professional MMA fighter. So without further ado, welcome to the world of futures. Ira, thanks for joining me, my friend. Anthony, a pleasure. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. All Thanks right. Everybody. So, you know I'm an avid reader of the blog. You're on Futures Radio Show all the time. We're always uh, getting into great discussions. And I always get a lot of feedback from our listeners about why you and I talk about yield curves so much. Explain to everybody why they should be watching yield curves, even if they're not trading them. Over my 42 years of experience of trading and with my back, educational background, money flows are very important. And yield curves, when the world is in a more unstable position, really give you an indication of what people are thinking about in a more longer term investment horizon. But I apply it to my daily, to my daily trading when I see certain types of movement. Now, the last time that you and I spoke on Futures Radio Show, we were talking about a steepener trade that you were looking at. I believe you're looking to buy the 210 for a steepening trade because of what was happening in the 530. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing right now happening in the yield curves? Well, it exactly did pan out because everybody was looking for an inversion. The inversion didn't happen on the 210. It got down to 8 or 9, then it popped up to recently 20, but we're holding in this range. The 530 was very indicative because that did exactly what we had talked about, which it came down, tested during all the uh, pandemonium in the equity markets in December, came down and tested uh, the 200 day moving average and then bounced out of there for another 25 basis points. And now we're kind of settled in here and the market's trying to uh, make a decision. Any trades on the horizon right now that you're looking for, or are you still sitting in the, uh, the 210 steep? Um, I'm, well, I'm, I'm actually trading more, trading more of the 530 right now because okay. it's giving you more, and the 530 is more of a speculator's currency. So everybody's talking about the economy slowing, and my mailbox every day fills up with people who just tell me how bullish they are bonds. Not To me, if, if you buy a 10 or 30-year uh, bond, you're, I don't agree with that. I think it's going to be a terrible trade for you. So I want to go back to what you just said on the 530. You said that's more of the speculative, right? Mm -hmm. Explain that. Well, the speculators like to play there. So when they get a hunch that, hey, I'm getting bearish that, I can play it in a more conservative manner. It's going to steepen out. And I think we're seeing that. And again, it comes from my viewpoint right now, Anthony, that we are sitting in a situation that we haven't seen, which is unemployment is at 3.8%. This is record low unemployment, as we got reminded the other night in the State of the Union. But whether or not, it's, but the last time we were down at these levels, we were running budget surpluses. We have a trillion dollar deficit this year. And that's why I think these curves are steepening out because I think the world is gonna shy away from buying long US duration. That it's not gonna be the safe haven that people have believed that, deemed it to be. That's, that's gonna be a relationship that shifts. So you have a lot of media and people out there on social media talking about the yield curve was inverting, and then that was the really short end of the curve. Right? I don't remember even exactly right. which one it was because I don't watch it. But um, for everybody out there that maybe isn't watching yield curves, or maybe they are, what yield curve specifically should they be watching for the inversion that everyone's talking about that would that would be hurting the economy? Well, some some academics will tell you the. 30-day to 10-year, um, which is good, but I watched the 210. That's what I watch. And in 2006, 2007, that inverted. People were, but I watched it, and it was indicative of what the havoc that was going to come, and it really led me to a short S&P position. It takes a while. Everybody's trying to time these. They're very difficult to time. I can't tell you it was four months, five months, five days. Nobody can because it's always changed over the time that, that I've studied these, and I have a lot of time put in studying these. And just to be clear, when the 210 inverts, that indicates recession, problems for the U.S. economy. It has, because when anybody's willing to take less on long-term money than they are for short-term money, it's telling you that they're nervous about what's on the horizon. That's what really that tells you. 
Let's talk about some of the trades that you're eyeing in gold versus currencies. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an idea of which ones you're looking at uh, in gold versus what particular currency and, and what sets up that trade? Well, what sets up is that people are nervous about the central banks. That the so central banks really don't have a handle on how to exit this quantity, you know, QE, as we've come to call it, and this mass amount of, they don't have an exit point. So that's what's really the motor behind it, I think. So that's the fundamental backdrop, but yeah. I know that you use technicals mm -hmm. to help you with your execution of trades. So what are you looking at technically to help you get into a gold trade? Well, I, right now they've broken out. They've broken out of their two hundred gold euro well above the 200-day moving average. You're getting a little mean reversion now, which is good. So are you long gold right now? I am long against the currencies. Yeah, gold Swiss has been really a nice play here. I actually just moved out, and I'm putting on gold yen. The yen has been a repository when people get nervous because the Japanese have a lot of money invested around the world. When they get nervous, they bring it home. So that has been the least dynamic over the period of time because the yen has held up very well. But the Bank of Japan has put itself in a very precarious situation. And I think that when Japanese investors really start looking at it, the gold yen is going to be, will, will bear some more powerful fruit. Right now it's not because the yen is deemed a safe haven, but I'm a little ahead of myself. But the gold Swiss has been a very, very good play. So what was the, one of the first things that you and I learned when we were on the trading floor? Know where you're getting out before you're getting in, right? Absolutely. So what gets you out of these trades? I understand the fundamentals are getting you in with this technical breakout. So does it technically, if it gets back below a specific moving average or something happens, yeah, absolutely. get you out? Absolutely. And okay. we're not we're not close to them. So we're running here. This is the hardest part of making this trade because if you believe that a lot of technicals are mean reverting, then it's going. the trade will work against you. So if I get out, at this point in time, why am I getting out? And if I'm and if it keeps running, where am I going to get back in? But really, for a trader, this is really a good point because they're not really running now. They, they've moved, but they're not running. <coughs> in fact, if the dollar actually starts to come under pressure against the gold, the, it'll it'll just move me out of the currency end of it. So I'm actually looking to lift my short leg because I'm bearish the dollar. I'm one of the few people out there bearish the dollar because of the deficit situation. Right now, it's not really doing anything, but I'll lift a leg and just stay long gold versus the dollar. All right, I want to move on and talk about China and the trade deals. And I don't want to talk about trading the headlines, Ira, because yeah. I just I don't think that's a great strategy. But I know that you're looking at the dollar yuan right now for some trades. And, and not only in the dollar yuan, but you say that that's been uh, a good indication of what's going to happen in, in the S&P, the equities markets. Talk to us about that. Right. So you and I talked about this. So. When we saw those headlines that came out January 17th, 18th, oh, the, the Chinese, when they were sitting down with uh, Mnuchin and uh, Lighthizer, that they said, well, we can eradicate the U.S. trade deficit, which is substantial, because we could buy so many goods. Well, that prompted an immediate rally in the S&Ps. Everything was good. Oh, is it just what the, that's how we're going to resolve this? So it's very bullish to the U.S., and we won't see the tariffs. So if that's the case, well, a lot of people put out things that they would, were bearish to yuan then. But no, I saw it a different way. And I said, if the Chinese are going to buy all that, they want the yuan to go higher. Because if you're going to import a massive amount of goods, you want to do it with a stronger currency. Because that's what's going to empower your middle class. It, a weaker currency uh, harms your middle class. Because if you're paying more for imports, so if the yuan were, were to go from 6.8 to 7.2, imports would be more expensive. But if the yuan were to go from 6.8 to 6.5, imports become less expensive. So that's why, and yuan from that day, it had an initial move down, but since that day, it's moved up about 7 or 8%. So uh, I'm not long it, but I'm watching it because it's, and now we're in a very critical area. Last thing before I let you go, I know that you're looking at emerging, emerging markets versus developed markets. Also, for potential trades in the currencies you're trading and going back to the S&P. Talk to us about that. Right. So again, so now filtering from the yuan, if that's the case, if the Chinese d deem they're going to import all this U.S. goods, it has to be so positive Mexico because so much of the supply lines that we keep talking about for the U.S. manufacturers come out of Mexico and even Canada. So there's a lot of that, and that'll help. To me, I'm watching the peso. Now, the 200-week moving average in the peso becomes fairly significant, and I would pay, really pay attention to that, as does KSU 
the railroad line because so much of these goods will be transported. So these are indications that I'm looking, but it's all going to be all over the world. Because if the Chinese move from being massive exporters to being massive importers, it will move up all the emerging markets that, that sell to China. Great stuff as usual, Ira. Thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure, Anthony. It's great. All right, everybody. Next up, we'll be speaking with Morad Askar about the E-mini S&P, crude oil, and statistical modeling for an edge. So stay tuned. This is my headquarters. This is where I trade and manage my portfolio. Since I added futures, I have access to the oil markets and gold markets. Okay. I'm plugged into equities, trade confirmed. And I have global access 24 seven, meaning I can do what I need to do. Then I can focus on what I wanna do. Visit learnfuturestoday.com to see what adding futures can do for you. Why trade futures with TradeStation? You can trade over 80 products from home, work, or on the go with a powerful, easy to use interface and prices that let you focus on padding your wallet, not emptying it. Upgrade your trade at TradeStation.com. Why trade with TradeStation? It's innovative, easy to use, and totally freaking sweet with powerful tools to track and execute your trades and low per trade commissions on stocks, futures, and options. Upgrade your trade at TradeStation.com. Welcome back, everybody. I'm joined by Julian Mula, like the money, and Morad Askar, otherwise known as Futures Trader 71. Now, Morad, I know you're a discretionary trader, but you're big in statistical modeling. Why? I think the best results in trading come from having confidence in what you're doing. Uh, there's a lot of room to question what you're doing as soon as you put the trade on. So to me, statistical modeling, wherever I can apply it, is really important because it backs up my belief or idea with some hard numbers. Uh, and so I'm able to put on the trade and hold on for, for as long as it takes for the trade to play out. So statistical modeling is really a cornerstone of building a, becoming a bigger trader, I think. So you worked together with Julian, who developed Red Sky, to build a model. How did that process go? So it was really easy working with Red Sky. Um, all I did was uh, turn to Julian and, and give him uh, some basic parameters for the model. And uh, a little bit of coding, and simu I simulated the trades and summarized the results. All right, great. Can we see some of these stats and uh, also a chart setup of this? So just to understand what we're doing here, we're looking at what's called the initial balance, which is the first hour's high or low, uh, the first hour's range in the pit. If you're seeing the screen here, you're paying attention to the column, the highlighted column called neutral. This is how often historically over all these days, uh, the S&P will take out the high of that first hour, the, first, uh, the, the initial balance, and then take out the low. It only occurs 28% of all days historically, very low probability. So now we can play the opposite of that. So there's a 72% chance that when the S&P breaks the initial balance high or low, it's not likely to come back and take out the other side. So now that's the raw model that, we, that I handed over to, uh, to Julian. Uh, and then from there, we start to build an actual setup. All right, let's remember we're taking a look at some of these charts now. This first one's for the E-mini S&P, right? Yes, yeah, so this is the actual setup. So a raw statistic is all good, but you don't know how it's going to perform in the market without setting up a risk parameter. You know, what's your stop going to be? What's your trigger? And what's your target? And so this outlines in detail here uh, what those are. The gray area on this chart just shows us the time period for the initial balance to form, the first hour of trading in the S&P. We mark the high, we mark the low, but we also need the midpoint in between them because that controls our stop. So once we have that, the market breaks. So in this example here, uh, as soon as we trigger at 26.61 and a quarter, uh, we are long and then our stop is the midpoint minus three ticks. That's the fixed parameter that I've provided Red Sky with. And this is an example of how, how it, uh, it would set up on a chart. Now, Morad, I love these stats. No offense, Julian, but just because I have good stats doesn't mean I'm going to make money. It's all about the execution. So, Morad, how has this model helping you get an edge in your trading? 
Okay, so you're exactly right. You know, we could come up with all kinds of things that may or may not work, but the, the proof comes when you, it's not truly an edge until you decide what the risk parameter is going to be, what your entry is, and what your target's going to be. Those three things can vary the statistics incredibly. So for this particular model, what we did is we said we determine the first hours high and low. So you can see on this chart it says the range high. So those, those bars, the gray area outlines the first hour. So the range high is set to 2661 in this particular example. The range low is 2647 on the S&Ps. Now the, the trade is triggered if the market goes a tick above that high or a tick below. As soon as it's triggered, a stop is put in at the midpoint. The midpoint is the exact middle in between the high and the low. So we have a stop that's the midpoint minus three ticks, okay, to give it a little more room. And then the objective is twice our stop. So we're going for a two to one uh, reward to risk ratio. Uh, so once it triggers, the expectation is the market doesn't, is not likely to come back and hit our stop, of course, but the probability of triggering above 2661 and coming all the way down to 2647, that's the 28%. So we're banking on that 72% probability that it's just likely to keep, it's likely to keep going. That's what this chart is showing. The green area is the, is it hitting the objective? Uh, that's, that's the area where the trade is on. The gray area is the, is the area that outlines uh, the parameters, the initial parameters to take the trade. This is the same chart for crude. Uh, the parameters have to be a little bit different for crude. Crude is more volatile, it's a thinner product. So instead of three ticks below the mid, a stop of three ticks below the mid, we have to go with 21 ticks, which is one full rotation in crude. Uh, same, same target uh, ratio, same everything else. Uh, it's just we're modifying the stop a little bit. You love this initial balance, Morad. Why do you love the initial balance so much for a trade like this? The initial balance is important. It's an idea that comes from Peter Stadelmeyer back in the 1980s uh, when market profile was, uh, was a thing that he was developing with the uh, Chicago Board of Trade. The initial balance essentially, if you look at a volume bar chart, a 60 minute bar chart of volume, you'll notice that the volume peaks out in that first hour and it dies out over lunch and then it peaks out on the close. This is because a lot of the big business in most products is, is done in that first hour. So whatever we do in the first hour, that's where the, the bigger business is occurring. And then for the rest of the day, it kind of goes into a lull and it picks up as people square up their positions for margin or, or whatever at the end of the day. So the initial balance is simply capturing the, the bigger participants or the bigger portion of the movement of the day. So it's really an important yardstick that measures out how we can expect the day to play out. Yeah, I agree. In my trading, uh, I don't call it the initial balance, but I always say wait to see what the first hour does and how it closes is going to help me determine what direction I'm going to trade uh, for the day. Maybe not the whole day, but at least right. a part of the day. Now, you have this trade. Can you share with us some of these hypothetical results that you guys have? For that, I'm going to turn to Julian. Once we have this put together, I can say, hey, Julian, I have a bunch of people who want to take the same signal and you can, you have a system that allows that to be turned into a signal that people can get via text and other means, push signal or, or text. Exactly. And they can be alerted when this triggers on various products, correct? Yes, that is the Red Sky Markets website where uh, over the course of the day, subscribers receive alerts on different signals that uh, occur in the market and uh, those alerts come with uh, a complete backtest, which is an explanation of what happened in the market after the signals occurred in history. Okay, and you can show us an example of that? We have an example. This is an example of uh, crude oil being down 3%. This happened about two hours ago, and mm. our backtests describe after such an event occurred historically, then what happened in the market an hour later, two hours later, all the way to five hours later, and then also we have another set of studies for what happens day late, days later. Great stuff, Julian, and Morad. Morad, before I let you go, as I said from the beginning, 
you and I were both discretionary traders. And for me, I've always felt that my strategy can't be executed as well if it was automated versus me doing it myself. So you as a discretionary trader, as we said, you love, uh, you're big on statistical modeling. How is this helping you in your trading? So I try to take away the guesswork as much as possible. Discretionary trading is a tricky thing, uh, as opposed to algo trading or systema systematized trading, which there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that I feel like my mind can process much more contextual information than I can program into a system in the way that I trade. And it's important for me to back up my beliefs. Maybe it's a false confidence, but it's confidence nonetheless. I can back up my beliefs on what the market behavior is by modeling it, you know, like knowing that 97% historically of all days, the S&P will take out the Globex higher low after it opens, after the pit opens. 97%, that's, that gives me a pretty good target to look for once the market starts behaving in a certain way. That's really the foundation, you know, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't matter for a one lot or a two lot, but when you start trading 40 lots and 50 lots or bigger and you want to grow as a trader, statistical modeling becomes that, uh, that anchor that helps you justify the position you're taking as opposed to just guessing or worse, hoping. Yeah, I, I mean, it makes sense. The probabilities are in your favor. Everything's lining up for you. Maybe you're going to size up on this particular trade. I said it was one last thing before I let you go. I kind of fibbed there because I want to follow up with if you find something that's really good like you did here, do you ever just automate this on maybe just a smaller contract size and let it run? Um, I have not done that because I'm a bit of a control freak when it comes <laughs> to trading. But the smart thing to do is to test this across, you know, all CME products and find out which ones it works on and just to, to have it running and to be, to participate even on a, on a one lot basis, like you said, although I have a hard time managing trades with just a binary one lot. Um, that, that would be the smart thing to do, but I'm not there yet, and now you're convincing me that I should probably look at that. We're going to do that on a different show at a different time, Maura. Thank you for joining me, Julian, as well. All right, everybody, next up, we're going to talk about how you can use the cold air to maximize your both physical and mental well-being. Stay tuned. This is my headquarters. This is where I trade and manage my portfolio. Since I added futures, I have access to the oil markets and gold markets. Okay. I'm plugged into equities. Trade confirmed. And I have global access 24-7, meaning I can do what I need to do. Then I can focus on what I want to do. Visit learnfuturestoday.com to see what adding futures can do for you. Why trade futures with TradeStation? You can trade over 80 products from home, work, or on the go with a powerful, easy-to-use interface and prices that let you focus on padding your wallet, not emptying it. Upgrade your trade at TradeStation.com. Why trade with TradeStation? It's innovative, easy to use, and totally freaking sweet. With powerful tools to track and execute your trades and low per trade commissions on stocks, futures, and options. Upgrade your trade at TradeStation.com. Welcome back, everybody. I'm here with Morad, Ira, and Nick Janowitz. And Nick is going to talk to us about how to use the cold air to maximize your physical and mental well-being. Nick, before we get into how that uh, all works, tell us what you were doing last week. Well, during the polar vortex in Chicago that we had about negative 50 degrees last week, which was like record temperatures, and most of Chicago was locked up in their house, I was outside running. Uh, in negative 50 degree weather with no shirt on. <laughs> Ira told me that he's going to drive home today with no shirt on because it's 30 degrees here. Is that true, Ira? <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely true. Okay. Yeah, so, so uh, a few years back I came into uh, uh, contact. I'm a professional MMA fighter and I own a gym. So I'm always trying to look for that advantage and that full balance uh, when it comes to athletics, the body, the mind, all that stuff. And uh, a few years back, I came in contact with um, uh, the power of oxygen. And I started using a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, uh, which I ended up purchasing because it was really uh, relieving me of all those injuries, helping me recover faster, taking the inflammation out of my body. And then uh, we've known for years, you know, taking ice baths and things of that nature, uh, how it takes the swelling out. 
And then uh, about a year ago, I came in contact with this uh, uh, wild, crazy man out of the Netherlands called Wim Hof, and he's been doing all these uh, amazing things like climbing Mount Everest with nothing but shorts on, uh, swimming in uh, under ice and running, I think he did a marathon, ran above the polar circle and just barefoot, no, nothing but shorts. So it was very intriguing, me being a wild man myself. So I started practicing some of his methods, his breathing and a adding in some of the cold therapy. And it has been doing some crazy things to my body where I never thought I was gonna be able to do such things like this. How do you go about testing yourself? Because to me, I mean, it sounds like, like well, a lot what a trader would do, right? You know, more we test ourselves with positions. We're always seeing how much we could gauge because I mean, I don't think I could go outside right now. And no, 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 right? absolutely not. So, I mean, I definitely uh, started building it up and we have this thing in our body called brown fat that you're born with. But as civil, we've become civilized and, you know, put, got clothes and houses and heating and all that. Um, we don't require it anymore. Infants require it because they don't shiver. So we end up losing it. I guess it's that saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. But with, uh, once you start creating the brown fat, you'll start being able to withstand more uh, severe temperatures. So a shower, just jump in, feel that rush of cold water is the easiest way. You, I mean, just seconds. It's, you know, when you jump in that cold water, and you hear that, that's what you want. Once you start feeling that on a daily basis, and it doesn't have to be long, you don't have to sit there for hours or anything like that, uh, it starts triggering that part of your brain, your autonom system, that we know very little about, that controls the emotions, that controls all these different feelings, your adrenaline, and it's gonna help you process that. And then once you start doing that on a daily basis, then you go to ice baths, then you can do this, then you could just go in negative 50 degree weather like me and feel like an Iron Man and you know, uh, be able to withstand that. So what turns you on to this? Um, well, I'm always looking for balance. You know, I, I, I've been uh, a firm believer in that for you know, 20 years. And whenever, you know, in being in um, having a gym and, and training tons of athletes and professional athletes, I'm looking for the best that they can be and the best that I can be. And so when you see a guy like Wim Hof climb Mount Everest, it really triggers something with nothing but shorts. You know, I mean, that's negative 50 degrees and he's climbing that. That is, what is, is that all about? You know, they took him and some of his students and they shot them with an endocrine of E. coli and their bodies immediately killed it. So it's helping with bacteria, helping with just overall function of the brain. And uh, that, that's, you know, the, the basis of it. If that's how you're gonna feel and feel like a true Iron Man, why not try it? So I've been experimenting, experimenting with it and I think it's unbelievable. And I think if I, I compare a lot to what traders do to what athletes do because mental, the, the mental performance that goes into being a trader, I mean, we're not doing something physical, but it's so important for me to train myself to be able to stay focused for a long period of time. And, and you've noticed this type of a result, yeah. being able to stay focused. Even in your MMA, when you're fighting, you feel that by doing this is helping you stay focused throughout a fight. A Anthony, you, you weren't made to sit in a, a desk all day long. You have to find balance. So if it's working out, if it's getting that cold shower, if it's doing something, you have to get back to what the human body was designed to do. And that wasn't just sit. And, and be sedentary all day long. We're hunters and gatherers, and that's what you need to try to find that balance in your life between trading, uh, you know, going to school, doing whatever it is, being a father, to being a hunter and gatherer. And that's what I'm, you know, trying to find that balance in. And I think I've come pretty close to finding it for sure. <laughs> Great stuff, Nick. Yeah. Talk to us about your gym and your apparel. Yeah. So if you want to learn more, I just uh, uh, I own a gym, Patriot Sports and Fitness in Elmhurst, Illinois. It's in the uh, Chicago land, uh, Chicago suburbs. And uh, I just launched my uh, clothing line, Patriot Made Apparel. It's got that uh, American, proud American uh, vibe to it, and uh, it's definitely athletic based. So if you want some funny shirts and uh, uh, athletic clothes, Patriot Made Apparel, check it out. I'll be checking it All out, right. Nick. Thank you yep. so much. Ira Morad, that's a wrap, everybody. Thank you for joining us on Futures TV Show. You can watch us at futurestvshow.com, and don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> you guys got Ira with, Ira with a training card.